<laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to our last session before lunch. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Bebka Blyder from Tilburg University to talk to us today about how role settings affect character traits and personality. Hi again, and thanks for having me. So uh, now it's on me to talk about uh, my project with the kind of the wacky title, loving mom, you know. <laughs> um, and I come to that title later on. Um, I have to admit that I cannot present any data. Actually, I just completed the data collection, and two days ago, my research assistant, she's still in Germany, I'm already in the Netherlands, she called me and said, yay, we got the last smartphone back. So we just completed the data collection. So this year, I will only like tell you about the theoretical background and the research design of uh, my study. And next year, we leave all that out, and I will only present tables. <laughs> 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 So, but uh, yeah, let's talk about the theoretical background. And actually, we already heard that um, research into our re scientific psychology has kind of like um, neglected research into character traits, moral qualities, virtues, and strengths for a long time. And um, yeah, personality psychology in particular, um, it actually was one of our biggest classic heroes, namely Gordon Alport, who claimed for a focus on more or less neutral personality traits instead of uh, positive qualities such as character traits. He said, um, there's confusion between personality evaluated and personality evaluated. That is, between personality and character. And there are no moral traits until trends in personality are evaluated. And tests which deal with morality admit an extra and uncertain variable. Well, having said that, that was probably the time when most personality psychologists waved goodbye to the character and said, hello, personality. And I was curious about um, the impact of Gordon Alport's uh, uh, statement at that time. And I uh, took a look at the issues of one of our flagship journals, namely the Journal of Personality, and I looked for articles that included the term character in the title. And I think, uh, well, the consequences of Gordon Alport's statement are quite obvious. And there even were like 20 years in which not a single paper appeared um, that included the term character in their title. But um, looking at the last 12 years here, well, there seems to be a comeback of the character. <laughs> and, um, as can be also seen, I, I mean, that's quite obvious. We are meeting here, we are talking about a lot about a character, and we have a lot of fascinating talks so far. There obviously is a renewed interest into positive qualities, um, moral traits, character, virtues, and strengths. And in personality psychology in, in particular, um, this is kind of triggered also, or I think it might be triggered, by the recent developments in the rather new field of positive psychology with Martin Seligman as one of the main figures. And actually, he even says that um, the character itself is a core concept in the scientific study of human behavior. And although maybe not all personality psychologists would go that far, at least nearly all of them would agree that we cannot longer ignore research into character traits, which is also like flourishing in other fields like theology, philosophy, sociology, and economics. Um, so, research into character traits clearly hits the sidekicks and also has a great appeal in terms of like, um, moral, moral hazards, financial myths of conduct. But we should also not forget, uh, forget and uh, Matthias already said that, that there are still several open issues regarding the nature and um, properties of character states. And it, in fact, um, it was not without cause that scientific psychology have kind of neglected research into character traits for a long time. It were actually three major critiques that have frozen research into character traits for nearly a century. And these can be labeled the consistency issue, the accuracy issue, and the redundancy issue. And from my perspective, we should carefully reconsider these issues by using modern research designs and methods if we want to reestablish a more sustainable psychology of the character that um, yeah, will survive the next 100 years and not like And um, in the following, I will um, outline these issues in, in, in more detail, and I will also try to show how I am uh, trying to address these issues with my project. Um, so let's start with the consistency issue. We already heard about it, and it 
is for sure, or it has been for sure, the most smashing critique of the psychology of the character. And um, it addresses the question, how consistent are people with respect to their character rather than behavior? Is it actually our character, or is it rather situation, situational pressures affecting our moral conduct? Um, in fact, yeah, we heard about this question several times during the last uh, two days, and um, these questions are nearly as old as scientific psychology itself. And uh, in the late 1920s and early 1930s, there were the famous Hartman and Maid studies that sounded the death knell for the early character research by showing that the cross situational consistency of moral behavior is rather low. So a child may be consistently honest with his peers, but not with his parents or teachers. And from this and other results, Hartman and May concluded, well, Character traits are not robust at all, but rather specific functions of life situations. And decades later, um, the, the consistency issue has been brought up again, and it mainly was evidence from experimental social psychology um, that has shaped, that, that shaped the situationist view of behavior. And according to this view, not only research into character, but into personality traits in general, is totally meaningless because uh, traits do not have a significant influence on actual behavior. It's all about the situation. Okay, luckily, we, um, Angela already said that we're kind of getting over it, and most uh, psychologists prefer today a more nuanced picture. So, um, because the debate has kind of moved from pitting um, personal and situational factors against one another toward examining how both can inform each other about the way. Uh, about the ways in which traits might affect an individual's behavior in a particular situation. So, yesterday we had that little um, discussion about between Christian and actually, I'm sorry, I don't know her name. <laughs> whether whether it, whether actually a character exists and whether there are situations in which we like express our character. I think that it might be we just maybe like reformulate the, the original question of whether there's consistency at all. Um, and we, we might rather ask whether how and under which conditions trade re uh, related behaviors would show a certain degree of consistency. And um, yes, so I am, um, like Angela would call me, a Fleeson follower, because I think a good model um, to do that is a density distribution approach. Um, according to this approach, traits can be considered as density distributions of the corresponding states. And states are um, defined as like trade relevant behaviors, feelings, and thoughts. So according to this approach, individuals can express nearly all levels of their personality traits uh, in their everyday behavior, which explains the large degree of within person variability in personality states across situations. But on average, people tend to show certain individual specific levels of these states. So um, this is reflected in relatively stable um, means and standard deviations of these density distributions. So, and these can be considered trait-like individual difference characteristics um, um, that are relatively stable. So this um, approach acknowledges both the high consistency of average behaviors as well as the cross-situational inconsistency of single behaviors. Um, um, studies that have, uh, have adopted uh, this approach um, to, to examine the interplay between states, traits, and situational features, most of them have uh, used a special method. Ma Matthias uh, um, has already talked about the experience sampling method and I will only shortly shortly refer to it, what it means to, just to do an experience sampling study in personality psychology. Actually, it's an umbrella term for a lot of uh, a set of data collection techniques in which participants um, often receive smartphones, personal digital assistants, or other electronic devices which they use to respond to repeated assessments um, over the course of time while functioning within the natural environment. So. Um, this approach allows to um, sample personality relevant behaviors and situational features um, as they occur in daily life. So it's still self-reports, but well, we are very close to the behavior because participants carry those devices while acting in their everyday like environment. Um, I myself use this approach to study um, 
personality states and whether those can be linked to social role context. Um, there are a lot of situational cues you can look at, and among the plethora of those um, situational features, I think the social role context is a very promising aspect because um, in social roles can be considered like conglomerations of a lot of situations that all share a common thread of behavioral expectations and so they um, kind of like um, give you a behavioral guidance what is right and what is wrong now in terms of your behavior. So typical social roles, for example, would be being a parent, being a, um, a partner in a romantic relationship, being in the job role, um, being a conference attendee, for example. So they um, they usually come up with a lot of behavioral expectations, and um, if you adopt to those expectations, you are usually rewarded by your social network. If you don't, um, if you don't like follow the rules, um, there are usually some negative sanctions. And um, I studied personality states and social role context in students, and I found that students' personality states uh, vary, in fact, not randomly, but systematically as a function of the social role context they were acting, uh, they were acting in. Um, participants were actually more neurotic, less extroverted, and uh, less agreeable when being in the student role as uh, compared to the friend role, well, that's not really good news for us, but <laughs> <laughs> on average, um, across social role context, there were stable inter-individual differences in students' general personal, uh, personality state levels, and the, uh, these differences can be considered like maybe trait-like individual differences. So, um, as illustrated by, by findings like, like, like this one here, um, the resolution of the person uh, situation debate has moved personality psychology beyond the, uh, uh, the person situation debate and instead of asking whether personality exists at all, we, we rather ask how personality works. Um, I think the time is right to also move the, the character approach beyond the person situation debate and instead of asking do stable character traits exist at all, we might rather ask when, how and why do people vary in their character relevant behavior across situations and across time. So let's have a look at my study and how I'm trying to address these questions. Well, um, it is yeah, kind of obvious that um, I'm doing something with parents, yes. Uh, my sample are working parents, and since yesterday I know it's going to be 88 working parents, um, 20 male and 68 female working parents who were either half or full time employed. And the participants received a bunch of questionnaire and also a smartphone that was programmed with a special mobile data collection program. And um, it was we had a hard time uh, finding those parents, and you would think, why? They got a smartphone, yes, but that was really. Uh, had that annoying mobile data collection program because they had to uh, take part in an experience sampling study for 10 days and the smartphone triggered them six times per day to uh, respond really a lot of questions so that took uh, five minutes a day and this is kind of a long experience sampling study so they, they we, had a long, we had a hard time of explaining why we uh, would ask so many questions, but anyway, we found 88 parents, and um, they rated their current behavior, their satisfaction, and the degree to which they were occupying the parent was a job role. And I was not interested in um, in sampling the, the their concrete behaviors, like washing, cleaning the dishes, or doing the laundry. Um, but they rated the behavior um, by means of um, character and personality relevant adjectives because I wanted to um, assess their character and personality state. So how does that work? Well, um, with respect to the big five, I could draw an already existing measure which I used in a previous study that consisted of 30 bipolar adjectives. Um, um, we, uh, these uh, items are, can be used to measure the participants' momentary behavioral expressions of their big five in their behavior. So every time the smartphone uh, rings, um, the introduction was, think of your behavior during the last hour, to which degree can it be described as, for example, relaxed was restrained, indicating neuroticism, silent was talkative, indicating extroversion, imaginative was unimaginative, indicating openness to experience, 
Um, I'm gentle was uh, gentle, indicating agreeableness, or uh, ineffective was effective, indicating conscientiousness. And these items were um, ranked on a 7.5 polar uh, scale, so um, they could indicate the degree to which one or the other term described their behavior better. And there was also a zero category because sometimes, yeah, you are uh, not gentle, neither gentle nor ungentle because you are just alone in your room, for example. Um, to have a comparable measure to assess character states, um, we, my research assistant, Eva Eagle, and I, we, we conducted a pre-study because we had to um, develop a character state measure. And um, I brought uh, copies of the um, research report of that pre-study for everyone who's interested. Uh, we did that and what the results are. Um, <clears throat> so we, because we wanted to have a character state measure that is suited to measure the participants' momentary behavioral expressions of their character states according to the virtues and action classification by Peterson and Seligman that proposes six broad virtue categories. And um, again, we ended, we ended up with 24 bipolar adjectives. And um, again, the introduction was, think of your behavior during the last hour, to which degree can it be described as? And then I'll only present you some examples. Oh, um, okay. um, for example, smart versus unwise, indicating wisdom and knowledge. Um, brave versus covert, indicating courage. Empathetic versus callous, indicating humanity. Fair versus unfair, indicating justice. Respectful versus arrogant, indicating temperance. And faithful versus faithless, indicating transcendence. All right, so these are the uh, experience sampling measures. Uh, the participants also received a bunch of uh, questionnaires because we also wanted to measure their character traits, big five personality traits, and their subjective well-being in general, which is yeah the usual way to do it. So the introduction was, how do you see yourself in general? But um, the participants completed those questionnaires three times because we also wanted to measure their uh, role-specific uh, or their role identity, um, character traits, big five personality traits, and subjective well-being. So we also asked, how do you see yourself at work, and how do you see yourself as a parent? All right, and um, these data actually uh, allow to address a lot of different aspects of the consistency issue, and I will only present my core hypotheses because um, I assume that, uh, or referring to my previous work in contextualized uh, personality, I assume that um, the social role the person is acting in, uh, acting, uh, in has an important effect on, on the participants' character states and personality states. So I expect that um, character states vary not randomly, but systematically as a function of the social world context the person is act uh, acting in. So there should be significant within person links between social roles and character states. And I uh, deliberately focused on, on the parent versus the job role um, because uh, they represent prototypes of different sets of um, role uh, expectations, and I think they should probably, they will probably also differ in how adaptive different character states are. So, a case of point might be uh, the manager who's expected to act in an assertive, tough minded way, but yet is expected to act very differently in her role as a mother. But speaking of the managing mothers, um, it's also likely that not all manager moms adapt their behavior at home or at work, for example. So I don't think that um, these within personings between social roles and character states are universal. So I rather assume that people differ um, in the degree and the direction of those effects. And um, it, I, I think some of you are very familiar with the work of Walter Michel. This is what he probably would call um, event contingencies and differences between event contingencies or behavioral signatures. So these between person differences and the within person links between social worlds and character states might itself be interesting individual difference variables that might uh, also like predict interesting outcomes, but this is something that we or I can look at now until next year. Next year. So uh, finally, Although I expect character states to vary systematically as a function of the social role context, I also assume that there's at least some degree of cross role consistency that is founded by the person's general character. All right, so, so much about the consistency issue, which is, of course, the biggest issue we are still dealing with, uh, with uh, in, in not only with the character approach, but also with the personality approach. But 
There are still are two further issues I like on shortly for it. Um, so we already heard about the accuracy issue. Also, Matthias, um, actually, it seems like we are doing a lot of the same stuff at the moment. So the accuracy issue addresses the pitfall of social desirability. Uh, I think it's not a secret that um, the highly desirable nature of character um, traits involves a risk that character measures are particularly vulnerable um, to distortions and greater specific effects and proponents of the character approach do not deny these considerations but claim that these words need to be like considered from the vantage of positive psychology. For example, uh, Peterson and Seligman, they say, well, character traits are not biased by a response set of social desirability, but are effectively desirable. Which is true, but still it remains an empirical question whether it is possible to measure character traits accurately and to what degree social desirability effects distort people's reports on their character traits. Well, and uh, one way to address these issues is to have information from multiple sources on not only um, not only self-reports, so Taya and Matthias also reported data on that. Um, so what is needed are multi-rater studies to quantify the degree of convergence and divergence between self and other reports of character traits. And this is why the parents also received a set of uh, peer report questionnaires. So also a total of four peers um, assess the participants' role-specific personality and character traits, namely two peers who knew the participant exclusively in the job role and two peers who knew the participant exclusively in the parent role. And using this data, I hope that I found that there is a certain degree of agreement between self and peer reported character traits, like you guys already did, but I don't expect to find perfect agreement. Um, I rather assume that there are a significant rate of specific effects, which might either be due to socially desirable responding or self-enhancement, but it might also be that they actually represent unique perspectives from self and peer rate For example, due to the fact that um, that um, there are character relevant information that is not readily accessible to peers, but only to the self, uh, to the to the target <coughs> itself. And given that the latter point is true, I would, ex uh, uh, I would expect that self peer agreement is higher for interpersonally displayed um, observable traits such as kindness in contrast to more private character traits. Okay, so let's assume we find some consistency and accuracy um, evidence for the character approach. There uh, still remains one issue, namely the redundancy issue. Um, and this claims that character traits are redundant because they are already covered by established models of personality. And that actually brings us back to Gordon Alper, because since he has explicitly banished uh, the term character from personality psychology, almost a century of research has brought up well-examined uh, models of personality like the Big Five. And um, on, during the last few days, we also had the discussion whether what, what is the position of character traits in relation to the Big Five? Are they part of it? Are they like, is it, is it, uh, is it a different thing? Is it the same? Well, and uh, we also heard that, um, that, that early, like, uh, personality theories have kind of tried to, to, to exclude character-related terms, but modern uh, Big Five questioners clearly readopted um, re character-related terms. Um, so, in fact, McCray and Yun said, like, agreeableness, conscientiousness is a highly evaluated dimension. Indeed, agreeableness and conscientiousness are the classic dimensions of character, describing good versus evil and strong world versus weak world. So yes, there is a substantial overlap between character traits and the big five, but given, so this overlap does not mean that um, character traits are redundant. Um, what is needed to, to see whether character traits are redundant are multivariate studies to examine the incremental validity of character and personality traits and predicting relevant outcomes, um, such as, for example, subjective well-being, which is known to be related to both character and personality <coughs> traits. And in the present study, um, the parents also um, get, um, so there, there are both self and peer, rate, uh, peer reports on the participants' general and role-specific subject of well-being, and we also have the um, experience sampling measures of their uh, satisfaction in the given moment. So we, we uh, can address a lot of aspects regarding the redundancy issue, and what I expect is that there is a substantial, although not perfect, overlap between character and personality states and traits, so we can use both experience sampling data and questionnaire data. Um, 
I also expect that both character and personality states and traits are signific uh, significantly linked to participant subjective well-being. And here one particularly interesting question might be how character states are linked to satisfaction in that moment. Because usually we find positive links on a trait level, right, between character traits and sub subjective well-being. But I assume that on the within-person level, I would guess that this is not always true because um, acting in good character is sometimes exhausting, right? Like, uh, for example, not um, giving in to uh, temptation, acting moderate. It might be that the links are negative at the within person level, but this is something we should find out. Um, finally, I expect that character traits show <coughs> incremental validity um, over personality traits in predicting participants' subjective well-being, but also vice versa. So I assume that both character and personality states and traits predict unique variants in a person's subjective well-being. And um, given that we have not only self-reports, but also peer reports, experience sampling data, and questionnaire data, as well as general uh, information and role-specific information, we can um, address these questions on, 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 on different levels and maybe have a f more fine-grained um, analysis when, when personality traits or character traits are redundant or when not. Okay, so to sum up, the central purpose of my project is to re-examine the current approach in the face of the three major critiques that have led to its form of discredited personality psychology. And in doing so, I hope to substantiate the modern um, character approach in personality psychology with more solid arguments and just its near attractiveness. All right, thank you very much. And also, uh, thanks to the character project at Great First University, the John Templeton Foundation, and especially um, Josh Secrets, who <laughs> was very patient with me all the time. <laughs> thanks so much. Objectives and selectives with big five N for the beer. Because I know for a lot of the beer strengths, you know, the, all those strengths, you know, are pretty much identical to some of the facets of the big five, like you know, openness and creativity. So when you were creating those objectives, did you try to ensure that the, they were At all least, distinct from, from each other, or did you expect you know you were fine with there being some overlap? Yeah, we, so we at least tried that it's not the same words, right? right. So, um, but it's hard to exclude it because there is overlap, right? And, and yeah, so we started with 72 uh, adjectives and then run them down to 24. And but all the 72 adjectives they were not similar with the 30 we had in our big five measure. So yeah, it's not, it's not the same words. At first, but, yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is a question that's been sort of rolling around in my mind and getting stronger for the last three talks because all of you are talking about informant reports. Um, and the, the one question in my mind is, given um, Jeff's talk yesterday, we know that um, if someone thinks that you have a bad character, they are not going to like you. Um, and you'd be very unlikely to select that person to be your informant. Um, and I'm, I have no idea what you might do to get around that problem. But do you think the inner raider agreement among, if you said, get ratings from two people who know you well and like you, and two people who know you really well, but you don't think you get along that well, they don't like you that much, do you think they would agree about your character? And if they don't, what do you think that means? Wow, that's a, yeah, tough question. <laughs> First of all, we have to find people, I mean, you not the man and say, yeah, these guys, they really don't like me. And, um, I, I don't but know that's if it's practically feasible, but okay, then think what could happen. happen. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a mean level question, right? It's not like I'm, I'm more interested in the variability of acting in good character or not. So the question whether they agree on mean level on an absolute level, that's a different thing. Maybe, maybe they would agree and say, yeah, she is like kind of um, brave, but maybe, I mean, that's. This is something I'm, I'm looking at, um, but maybe they would more differ in the mean level and not in the in the variability when it comes to the role specific uh, questions. I, but I'm 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 not quite sure whether whether liking might affect self care. I'm not quite sure about that. That would be very interesting. Maybe that would be something you could also address in if you ask. 
the, the peer ratings, how much do you like that person? And then like see if that moderates uh, for some reason that sensitive. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, the the tests comment was really interesting, the audio clip about that, about, yeah, I don't trust her, but I don't really care if she's a friend anyway. So it, it might suggest that, like, for some people, you know, trustworthy isn't relevant to the, so. Okay. And we're actually trying to get informants, so we're gonna, I think dislike might be the wrong category. What you really want is people who don't especially like, so you, I think what you said is right. And so we get, like, friends of friends are good, or, like, teammates, coworkers, roommates, people who you get to know just whether or not you like them, they get to know you. So we're trying to get that. Daniel Lysing has done some work that it's hard. To, so the way Daniel Lysing gets around it is he has the targets be the informants. So he has the participants say, so he says, think of someone you know well and like, or know well and don't like, and compares it. But he doesn't get the tar the, those people's self reports or other things. But I think dislike is almost worse than like, because they're more biased in some ways than like. But I think if you can get people who are a little bit removed but still have a lot of opportunities, it's hard to I think in character, you're right, would be more biased than to say, like, extroversion, which very observable behavior. So someone might talk a lot or not talk a lot, and some people might like the person talks a lot or not, but certainly my character, it's hard to think of. Yeah, that person's a real jerk, but I really like them. That's yeah, mm -hmm. a little hard. <laughs> so, hey, this is a big picture question. I'm not sure. Um, suppose you find um, a correlation, or su suppose you find that um, the social role context does predict behavior. Do you think that that shows that it is the social role context that's explaining the behavior? Or could you design a study where you measure three things and still get the same predictive value? And those three things would be how perceptive the person is and picking up what's expected of them in different social roles, how much they care about how important they think it is to live up to those expectations. And third, how conscientious they are. So if you took those three things together, those three variables, do you think they would be equally predictive as social role context? Mm, I think the social roles I'm looking at come with enough pressure. I mean, being a conference attorney, my, my, that, that might be like that kind of variation in terms of what is allowed and what is not allowed where it's possible, but being a parent is quite serious, right? That comes with a very close range of expectations. It wouldn't be a good idea to, to be, I mean, it, it happens now and then, but it wouldn't be a good idea to be drunk at, at 4 p.m. and like be in charge of your, of your baby at that time, for example. So there are clear <laughs> um, <laughs> expectations, and I think it's the social role exactly come with that, that they don't need you to be very perceptive because they, they put enough pressure on you that you don't have to be very perceptive. But this this variable you are talking about might explain the between person differences in the responsiveness, right? Um, so not everyone is like adapting to the parent role um, the same, for example, not everyone might be, so my, my expectation would be that the people might be more agreeable, maybe, maybe, yeah, but this might also change depending on the age of the kids, so there are a lot of variations, I, I agree, but it might be that um, the, the uh, conscientiousness, for example, um, if you like look at this, or um, the, the responsiveness itself might um, explain part of the between person difference and how well people adapt to the social world context. Is that you, don't, you don't think like within subjects it would do so? So as you shift from one social role to another, you don't think there'd be predictive value there? If, as long as you knew how perceptive the person was about picking up what social role A required of them, how much, how important they thought it was to live up to those expectations and how conscientious they were. If you took those three things and then compared them between context A and context B, you don't think there'd be predictive value? Mm, yeah, I think, that, as I said, so I think both, like, the parent role is important enough that they don't, if they say, yeah, that's not so important for me, having a kid, I mean, that just happened. And then, uh, so I don't think that's necessary that we measure that. And it's the same for having a job. So, because what we measure is we, um, 
we had the, the question: um, Are you? Do you have to have that job? Are you like financial, uh, financially dependent on that job? We have that measure, for example. And if the if the partner of the person has a job too, so we can look at it actually. But I don't think that this might explain. Um, I don't think I, I don't believe that. But next year I can tell you more. <laughs> My question is slightly similar to that in terms of any possible gender differences. So you have these role expectations, and I think to some degree, at least in some societies, that there's a different expectation placed on males and females in terms of especially a dual role, motherhood and career, that um, at least there's this perception or they believe society uh, they have to be great at everything or be the best mother and do the best in your career where maybe those either expectations or pressure may or may not be present uh, for the males. And so I'd just be curious, how does that play out or does it play out in yeah, terms of what you're looking at? Definitely something we want to look at. I mean, it's, it's really too bad that we only have 20 uh, guys who were like willing to take part. But on the other hand, we have a lot of like uh, within person measures, so 60, a measurement occasions, and if you do it in a multi-level study, maybe with my gender as a uh, level two indicator, that might be um, possible to see some effects if there are effects, and then also to see whether um, the friend role might be as important for the guys as it is for the uh, for the girls. Um, I have a question about uh, measuring consistency because one of the tricky things I think about assessing whether someone is consistently virtuous is that. You don't necessarily know that by whether or not they behave consistently, say generously, in every single situation that generosity seems to be elicited. So one worry about the job situation, the job versus parents, is that the fact that a parent, say, isn't uh, warm and fuzzy in the job role for their own parent doesn't mean they're being inconsistent, right? Because the reflective person might say, well, I have the virtue of, of warmth, but because I'm reflective and I think about when it's appropriate to express this virtue, I don't express it in these situations by doing that. Does that mean that I'm, you know, not warm? Does that mean I'm expressing two different traits? Actually, no, this is exactly how I understand consistency, okay, okay. that it's not dichotomous, okay. but that it is, it is fair enough if a person like feels like acting in, in good character in that role, but not the other means that she's consistent, she or he, he or she is consistently um, honest in the pirate role, but maybe not in the job role. So this is an interesting thing. So I, I, I think we should stop ask that absolute question of consistency, okay. because this is probably not realistic to assume that, but rather to see which situational factors might have an effect of how how consistently um, character relevant we are behaving. Okay, I guess I was thinking um, an example of oh, yeah. that someone was talking about once in a paper and I forgot the name, so I can't that. But you know, a generous person could be someone who you might think, well, they'll, you know, if they're, you know, you know, they'll, they'll give generously when someone asks for money. Right? Now, that would be a sign of generous person to show that generosity. But we might think, well, maybe the generous person who's thoughtful decides that the best way to, to actually give money is to give a lot of money in one go to a big charity. So they don't, in fact, give money to people who are homeless. <coughs> Um, so there again, it doesn't seem to, whether or not they happen to, whether their generosity is role specific or just limited to one instance, isn't evidence that they are being inconsistent or only possess a trait at some time. I mean, we might be talking past each other. I mean, as I said, I'm a philosopher, not a psychologist. So, but I guess a little, I'm, I'm not I think sure. We are, the, we are in the same team. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, I will add to that, just building on the excellent way you described how the question is not no longer um, is it consistent or not, but there are different kinds of consistency. You should look at the different kinds of consistency. As, as Eric and I, we, we actually came up with 36 different kinds of consistency, <laughs> one of the, which you have <laughs> identified. Um, so I think, I mean, as you point yeah, out, they're all, exactly. yeah, just to uh, say what you're saying in a slightly different way. Thank you. Question, do you still have a question? No, oh, I'll defer to other people. Okay. There's time. I was interested in the, uh, the idea of relating uh, personality and character to well-being. 
Uh, and I was thinking of, a, I think, a different way of looking at it, or an interesting set of analyses to do. Um, one would be to look at uh, how variable individuals are across their social roles, and look at the relationship between that and well-being. So I'm actually doing a meta-analysis on that stuff at the moment, so that's a very interesting question. Yeah, so that, that, because the, that is a very uh, interesting thing, because it's uh, actually, uh, there, there are two kinds of research that always like pop up. The one is the vari variability is bad for you because of that sort of differentiation, and it's scary if we have to act it's in a way. It's just tiring to be a different person. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> to 95 and then But on the other one, and, yeah. so there's also research that shows that might be uh, very good if you adapt to the situation, and it's a kind of flexibility which makes you feel better. And then there's also like another kind of research like will show that it's uh, especially good when you act in a very specific way all the time. So um, this is a very interesting question. This will hopefully also like I can use that later on in another meta-analysis maybe than the other one. I had, I had one other variable I, I would add to that, which is so you can look at variability across situation A to B to C and look at that whether that predicts well-being. And I thought another potential moderator would be do I believe that I have a one true personality? Which is like, I think I'm an agreeable person at my core, deep down inside. And then look at whether the extent to which my roles require me to deviate from my believed one true personality and correlate that with well-being. And maybe that those who believe they have one true personality are negatively affected by variability that requires them to deviate from it. But other people who believe I just adapt to the situation as necessary won't be negatively impacted by That's a bad idea. variability. I wonder if you've connected this at all with Susan Linville's work on self complexity and that, um, to the idea that some people may which, think of themselves. Shall we? I'm sorry, the, Susan Linville's work on self complexity. So the, the idea that some people may consider themselves in terms of multiple self aspects or roles and others. Just as one. Yeah, we also in that in that meta analysis, we also have that research into self complexity. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, but yeah. Be because something interesting might go on there. So, so having a a complex self is often good for your health because it, it could be protective against depression. But I wonder if if something a little bit different might happen around moral attributes. If yeah, some right. of your self aspects are more moral in a sense than others, and yeah. so whether compartmentalization might allow you to, to, to be more immoral or have less character somehow in, in, in certain roles or aspects of your life. Yeah. So, cheat at work and be a nice person at home, or the other way around. Coming from two universities, we have a very interesting case there. <laughs> 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 So, yeah. I have a question about your meta-analysis. Um, one thing that I've been interested in lately in the, the social roles is how with Facebook and other social networks we have these weird blendings, right, where now all of our professional contacts are right there with our mother and our best friend from elementary school in the same space. So we have, it seems like less role differentiation. Right. I'm curious with the meta-analysis, since you're reviewing you know, all this research, if there's a way to kind of test that longitudinal aspect, are our social roles becoming less differentiated over time? Um, if you look back at like a decade ago. we are coding it, so yeah. I don't know how. So you can code for that, for example? Uh, so we didn't do that, but we, oh. I mean, this is an important thing where you can kind of like add it to the coding. Yeah, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, just a real quick on the subject of well-being. Um, if there is a link, uh, can you speculate about which way the causal arrow goes? Um, character traits. Uh, which one are linked to subjective well-being? No, so you, you said there's a link between character traits and subjective well-being. Yeah, usually um, it's generally positive, right? So all the character traits are especially positively linked to subjective well-being. There, uh, at least, like you may might know better that one then you know, with the virtues and action classification, all those core virtues are positively linked to it, especially. Humanity and all that interpersonal things are, seem to be positively related to subjective well-being. Right, and so my question was going beyond just correlations. Uh, 
any speculation about the causation? Oh, the causation. No, no data I know, but no. Uh, yeah. But just, so just speculation. Any, any speculation on that? Yeah, the the usual uh, causal explanation would be to say um, I'm feeling better because I'm acting in good character. So that is what um, at least like I think positive psychology is uh, also trying to tell us that uh, um, living a good life um, depends on, for example, character traits. Yeah. Uh -huh. so. But it could go the other way. For certain that we traits. feel better and are better people because we feel better. Usually, actually, so uh, it's the same with personality. The the, the direction of um, the causal direction is more like we say, okay, we feel better because we have certain character traits. So, yeah. But I, I don't have data on that. No, no, no. I, it's just <laughs> speculation. Yeah. I don't either. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, I think we're out of time on questions. Um, we'll have handouts up front and in the back for everyone, and lunch is in about 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you.